in Syracuse University today, um, Professor Charles Chuku. Um, Professor Chuku um, has been working on this subject. How many years, John? Uh, many years, at least 10 years. At least at 10 years. Time. So um, he worked for NASA. And while we were having lunch today, he told me about his going to the Lake Chad region and setting up what was necessary to be able to spot what's going on in Lake Chad from space. So I want to thank you all for coming. I sent out an email to you because you know what this means to me. This means a lot to me. So your coming here is of great support. And I really thank you for coming today. Um, Dr. Chuku worked for the National NOAA pro program at Howard University now, yes. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Yes, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Um, and he's doing that work, he told me at lunchtime, to coordinate the expansion of young people of color in the sciences to do this kind of research, scientific work. And this work is being coordinated out of um, Howard University. Up until 2018, for 10 years, he worked for NASA. The, 20. Eh? 20. 20 years. Yeah, this worked for about 10 years. This year for 10 years, but for 20 years, he worked for NASA. And NASA stands for, what does it stand for? National Air, Air Space Aeronautic Aeronautic and uh, Space Administration. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So you can see, as I was discussing with um, Dr. Michuku at lunchtime, this is one section of the U.S. government mm -hmm. that has tremendous amount of information on everything, on everywhere in the world. <laughs> But his brief for the past 10 years has been about um, Lake Chad. I um, met um, Dr. Chuku 2018 at the International Conference at Lake Chad when he was giving one of the lead presentations, giving the NASA um, view of what is going on in the Lake Chad region. And from that time, I said, no, we have to have you here up in Syracuse. And I told him then, and we wanted him to come to Syracuse University. Um, Dr. Chuku was trained in Eastern Nigeria. And for those of you in my class, male daughters, female husbands, um, at lunchtime we're telling him that we just finished studying in the Melik and the female goddesses. He's from that region. And after doing his undergraduate work, he went on to do his um, PhD in France. And so um, he has done his PhD in France, and he um, so tells me that he's been fluent in French. And then after that, he went for four years to do postgraduate work in um, Israel. And from Israel, he came to the United States. From so, here back to Nigeria? Germany. See? <laughs> <laughs> so here you go. Yeah. The point I'm trying to get at is that there are so many routes to becoming an international scholar. An international scholarship is what registers you to um, be able to speak with some authority. Now, um, Charles, I just want to say we thank you. And um, the, weather, the weather cooperated with us so that, um, that is my seat. The weather cooperated with us so that um, you did not have the circus weather when you choose here. So um, we are very happy that you came to spend the time with us, and we hope that this will be the beginning of a longer-term relationship. We have students here from different disciplines in the university. We have people from engineering, from arts and sciences, um, who have come to hear you. So please give him a Syracuse Welcome. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank, um, as I said, we met uh, only two years ago, actually, in February of 2018. 
but I'm going to show a, well, we didn't take a picture together, but there's a picture that kind of commemorates where we met together. Um, thank you uh, all for com coming here. I know uh, people are very busy, so um, it's not easy to uh, invite people to come and they show up, so thank you. I know there are students and professors here, so. Um, um, well, the work that I'm going to, and I'm, this is my first time in Syracuse, in the city of Syracuse, uh, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, and the weather welcomed me very well. There is no active snow falling on this day. So um, everything is fine, even the sun is shining. Uh, so the work that I'm sure I'm going to be discussing here is uh, work uh, that was uh, funded by NASA um, to study the impacts of climate change and uh, human activity. Uh, not only uh, over Lake Chad, but across the Sahel Belt and the Sub-Sahel regions of Africa. Um, and I'll, I'll go into how we, how we came into doing such work. Um, so it was funded by NASA, but as he mentioned, um, I uh, left transition to uh, become a professor at Howard University uh, because there was an opportunity to uh, coordinate uh, research that's funded, uh, well, it's a program, you say, a program uh, encouraging uh, minorities to study things relating to weather and climate. Now, this is funded by NOAA, and it's a consortium of 13 universities uh, led by Howard. They were looking for a, a distinguished scientist to coordinate the research across the 13 universities, so I decided to go there. And uh, so I'm still in the same realm uh, do research on the environment and climate. So uh, Lake Chad is right in the center of Africa. So um, many, many uh, decades ago, like in the 60s, it was full. So in the 70s, uh, the water started, um, you know, started losing much of its water. And you can see the progress uh, going forward. And even till now, it still has not recovered from uh, much of the water it lost in the process. So we're going to look at, you know, how did this come about? And uh, where is it headed? So anyway, much of the work we did uh, uh, is based on a satellite data analysis. And as uh, Professor Campbell explained, uh, NASA is a very, uh, is the, well, the biggest uh, space agents in the world. Uh, it does various things. As far as science, uh, there are different branches of science. Um, that NASA is uh, responsible for. But um, I'm showing some uh, missions that were launched to space to study Earth. Um, the other branches of uh, science that NASA looks at, some uh, study planets, other planets. And then there's another branch studying the sun, the solar activity, and uh, its influence in the, um, in the solar system. And then others study far away uh, distant uh, stars and the galaxies and all that. But I am an earth scientist, so I focus on the earth sciences. So some of the missions you see, as, as you know, uh, NASA's first mission was launched in 1958. And uh, there are still many, many missions that have been going on. And some of the uh, satellite systems you see here, and uh, we will um, uh, talk about some of them, some of the data from them that we used in the work that we're going to be discussing. So, um, so there is the International Space Station, which uh, many of you hear about. People who go to space, the astronauts, they go to visit base, conduct experiments, not only conduct experiments inside the space station, but also uh, set up instruments, uh, so, uh, yeah, instruments to look to space, some observing space, some observing Earth. Uh, some of these instruments do different things. Uh, this one I was involved with uh, looks at the solar irradiance, the energy from sun coming here, as you know, more than 99.9% of the energy on Earth comes from the sun. So we're looking at how it changes and to relate that to what's going on with energy distribution and the climate. So from that space station, a uh, picture of Lake Chad was taken in 2015. So you see it there, uh, that lake. So the uh, outline of what we're going to be talking about We'll talk about the entire uh, Sahel region and its relationship to uh, Lake Chad. Uh, we'll talk about what has happened with Lake Chad over the last century. 
And then we talk about the recent past, the last 20 years, studying the satellite observations. And we will try to uh, predict the future of Lake Chao, which is not an easy thing to do. And then we'll say uh, some of what we hope um, you know, will um, be done by the people that manage the lake to make progress in this area. Um, so, and my interest started uh, when I saw this publication uh, in 2002, when uh, this is Africa, of course, this is the location of the chat here. Um, in the pre-industrial times, the rain dam uh, really spanned a very uh, broad swath. Uh, but in the 1980s, you'll see that uh, the rain dam had narrowed significantly. And um, so, uh, I read this. This is part of the article that I put here. In the 1980s, uh, between 1970s and 80s, about a million people starved to death. Uh, so that concerned me, and I said, "Well, here I am, uh, working at NASA with all these resources. You know, so I should throw my weight into using what I have at my disposal to study what's going on there." That was how my interest came into studying that region. So the entire as a hell region, this whole region of what's going with the rain and the um, retraction of the rain band. So this is um, a uh, composite of measurements of precipitation in, the, in that region uh, by, by month. As you see, you see the scale here. You see the range of, um, of uh, millimeters of precipitation as it moves uh, through the seasons. You know, in the, uh, in the dry season, this part is dry season, it's raining down here. And then gradually, it moves back up, and then this becomes a rainy season, and then the dry season is in the southern part of Africa. But you will see that uh, Lake Chad itself gets water, gets the rain only about uh, a few months uh, June, July, August, September, four months of the year. That's when it rains over Lake Chad. So um, this is what we composited for the period of 1998 to 2015. Um, this uh, is not our work. Uh, this is work that was published where we look at the, uh, the trend of uh, the two essential uh, variables that people use to characterize climate, that is temperature and rainfall. So uh, you will see that uh, looking at the trend from 1950 to about 2008, it's been warming globally, and in some places more than others. That's for temperature. As far as precipitation, it's been increasing in some parts and decreasing in other parts. But look at this region. What do you see here? Rain has decreased in this whole region, which includes uh, Lake Chad. So, um, and uh, after seeing this, we looked at this again. This was from uh, 1950 to 2008. And uh, we looked at uh, trying to compare what happens the next year. And you will see that it's still drying. If you look at this, uh, you will see that it's, uh, this is vegetation greenness. Uh, during the time, during the rainy season, when you expect vegetation to be greener, uh, you will see that it's, uh, uh, there is uh, less moisture in that region. So. Um, Focusing on Lake Chad, uh, Lake Chad is a unique, is in a unique uh, kind of uh, situation where it's, um, it's, it, it has an advantage in that it's a, it's a bowl. So whatever water goes into the basin stays in the basin. Okay, it doesn't flow up anyway, it's an endorheic uh, lake. Uh, that's an advantage. Uh, but the disadvantage is that most of the basin is in the dry parts of Africa. Only just this part uh, receives rainfall. So only a small fraction of the basin receives rainfall, but once the rain gets in there, it stays there. Okay, so this uh, advantage and disadvantage of the unique situation of uh, the lake chat uh, within this basin. So, if you look at over since the 1900 to almost the present, you will see what's been happening with uh, the rainfall and the level of the lake. 
Okay, so you will see that they track each other. So, and the rainfall precedes the lake level. So, um, uh, when rain increases in that whole region, in the whole region of the Sahel, um, well, the lake level continues to rise. When the rain is going down, the lake level goes down. So we started looking at why is that happening? I mean, uh, so what is it that drives the rain in the whole region? So we looked at several uh, 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 phenomena, uh, climate scale phenomena that's happening in that area. Um, so the acronyms, this is a, uh, the AMO is Atlantic multi decadal Oscillation. That slow down, one. slow down. Yes. Okay, okay, so um, AMO means Atlantic multi decadal Oscillation. <coughs> uh, whereas this, you already know the El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO. And then we looked at the, the rain in the Sahel um, compared with the lake jet level, right? So uh, we're looking at these two uh, phenomena, these two uh, large-scale circulations uh, that drive uh, the, the climate and rainfall in that whole region. You'll see that they are, you know, I'm not going to spend time to look at the details of what we discussed here, but the, uh, one thing I have to mention is that I put the reference of the paper. Most of what we show here have been published. So uh, it's uh, once you look at this, the name and the year, you can find the, the paper. So basically, um, the summary from what you're looking at here, you'll see that this, this time, the 1960s and 70s, there was a very, very steep decrease in rainfall which was accompanied by decrease in the level of the lake, okay? And uh, after that, in the 80s, there was some recovery. So the rainfall, that's a purple line here, was recovering, and so did the uh, level of the lake recovery. We're going to be talking about what's going on here, okay? So but anyway, the summary here is that the Late 60s and 70s marked a very uh, significant turning point in the rainfall in that region and the lake. So this is the uh, this is the, this one. The AMO is the cool phase and the warm phase. So we are currently in the warm phase of the AMO. So basically, uh, we um, concluded that uh, the AMO has an influence on the rainfall in that region. And uh, the, its interaction, the interaction between the AMO and the N, uh, ENSO has some relevance, but the AMO has a greater influence on the rainfall in that region. But, all, but anyways, you know, once the rainfall is, uh, is happening, the lake level is following the rainfall. Uh, that's one thing. So we're currently in the warm phase of the AMO. So, um, So let's see what we're doing. Um, we're still going to go back and talk about that. But let's look at what's going on with the measurement, the satellite measurement state, the current period, uh, where uh, a lot of satellites are out there and looking at uh, different aspects of the uh, situation there. Um, this is a series of satellites that we are launched to measure uh, the, the change in sea uh, level you know, to monitor the sea level rise, as you hear about, you know, the ice sheets are melting, therefore it will contribute to sea level rise and so on. So there are a series of missions, and some of them are joint missions between NOAA and NASA and uh, the French Space Agency and the European Meteorological uh, Satellites to monitor. So this is a series from different satellites, okay, they are labeled here, to face Poseidon and so on and so forth, and continuing. So, um, this is just an averaging of this one. So uh, across this part of Lake Chad, where there is still water, so the track is always uh, the same. So over time, it's looking just to see, has it changed? Although the missions were built to monitor the uh, sea uh, level, it also monitors the uh, level of surface water, like lakes, you know, large lakes. So that's what we see here. So we'll see that it seems that uh, it doesn't change too much 
uh, because you know um, it's a very small portion of the lake that we're looking at. So, but um, something I wanted to say here is that the uh, there is seasonality in the level of the lake. It changes with time. So uh, when is it? When is the high period and when is the low period? So the average here shows that um, the low period is in June. The high period is in November. And the uh, irony is that the low period of the lake is during the rainy season, whereas the high period is during the dry season. Why do you think that is so? Question for you. Why will the why will the lake have its lowest level during the rainy season and its highest level during the dry season? Yes. Is it because when it's raining um, and during the rainy season, there's going to be more evaporation and the water cycle is going to be going more? So that means the water that does end up in the lake is going to um, be evaporated or be runoff other areas around it? Yes, you're close to the answer. Uh, you're actually, I'm, I'm very impressed with your explanation. Yes, there is evaporation, but remember that the lake is an indirect lake, so it doesn't flow to anywhere else. So the water that falls on the lake stays there. Okay, but there's a lot of evaporation, so that's one thing. But why, you know, it takes almost six months between the, uh, it's raining, it's raining, the peak of the rain season is around June, July, but that's the lowest level of the lake. And then the, uh, the dry season, that's the peak of the level of the lake. That's because the water that falls in the basin, the area where the rain falls, it takes time, it takes months to enter the soil and then to, uh, you know, to release the water, to percolate for a long time before it actually the whole water that fell during the rainy season would end up in the lake. So that's why it's, uh, it takes that long. See, when I look at uh, this region, and I've been seeing that for years, where the red dots represent a signal showing that there is fire, open vegetation burning in, in that region. So this is just one overpass. This is not like a composite of several days. This is one overpass of the uh, MPP bears on the 30th of January 2016, and it's all burning. So um, you will see that um, this is like Chad here. This is a place called uh, uh, the Baudelaire Depression. It is the largest dust bowl in the world. So uh, always during this period, a lot of dust, because of wind, a lot of dust is lifted, and it's mixing with the smoke from the fires, all of these fires. So you look at here, if I did not put the boundaries, you will not see the coastline because of the thick, um, um, uh, you know, the thick haze, uh, a mixture of uh, dust and uh, smoke. So I thought that this must have some effect on the rainfall in that region. So, um, so this is a picture I took myself when we went to Chad. Uh, to look at, uh, to do, to, uh, during the work we're doing, to install some measurements on the ground that we can use to uh, uh, validate our analysis. So this is the kind of thing. So they are, they are farming methods is you, you pile up the, uh, the vegetation and you burn it. So when you burn it, there are other impacts that we have studied, uh, which we have published actually. But uh, this is just to show the example of what we see there. So if you look overall around Lake Chad, you will see the dust is coming. You will see that much of the area that has vegetation has lost its vegetation and become a new uh, dust source. And then there is still fire going on all around, wherever there is still vegetation. So that's a major concern. And uh, with fires, we need to, uh, as we see in this example, we need to bare soil, which will now become a dust source and uh, with more dust, you will desertify in the region. And uh, as long as it is dry, uh, you know, you reduce the chance of producing rain. Yes. Um, isn't there agricultural burning practices? Are you saying that these are purposeful? 
buyers? Yeah, they are, some of them are agricultural, uh, like these ones, but others are uh, people, herders, the people who have cattle, mm -hmm. setting fire to burn the uh, dry and the, you know, uh, cement vegetation to allow new vegetation to grow up for the next season for the animals. I know that um, agricultural burning is very prevalent throughout Africa, but is there is there another, I guess, option? Because I know in Zimbabwe they do it as well. But is there any other options to it that they can have access to? Um, I you know I think it's a it's a matter of um, you know the the people who manage these things sitting down and deciding that this what they are practicing may be harmful to the environment and to their health and to find solutions. People put, food is produced in the US. But of course the US burns as well. You know, I have seen I've been to many, many field uh, experiments where we uh, see people burning, but not to this extent. So uh, it is possible. There is a possibility of you know doing the way they do here, you know, rather than uh, burning it. You know, rolling it together and keeping it for the animals to feed them. But then you need machinery and you need money to do that. And the land ownership system in that region is not, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard. But by sitting down and putting thoughts together, I think they can find a solution.